In 1933, the city of Chicago stages a World's Fair titled The Century of Progress to gloss over the Depression's misery. To involve African Americans, a special day-long event is mounted, featuring reenacted scenes from history, mass choral performances, and dance. Organizers hire a college student and budding choreographer named Catherine Dunham to recruit and train dancers. There were about 30 of us. And she walked over and she said, I'm Catherine Dunham. And at this time, we didn't know who she was. And she extended her hand to me. And I just knew I would dance forever, because this is what I had been waiting for all my life. After the event, Dunham retains a few of the performers to become the core of a new dance company, a goal she had sought for years. Catherine Dunham had chosen six or seven of us, and she asked if anybody would be interested in becoming a member of this company that she was forming. And of course, I was the first one to raise my hand. Dunham calls her troupe the Negro Dance Group, and though it enjoys some local notoriety, attracting audiences is an ongoing struggle. Dunham wonders whether a future in dance is truly viable and continues her academic career, concentrating on anthropology at the University of Chicago. During one course, she learns about the work of Melville Herskovitz, a prominent local professor, who is a driving force behind the study of African folkways. What makes the 30s an important moment for discovering African culture um, has to do with anthropologists during this time period. Many of whom have traveled to Africa, and those who haven't have at least um, traveled to Haiti, or Cuba, or Jamaica, places that um, still have strong evidence of um, African um, folkways and language and, and movement um, still very much alive and well in those communities. When Dunham sees footage Herskovitz filmed of indigenous West African dance, her own ideas about the relationship between culture and society crystallize. She resolves to merge her two passions, dance and anthropology. Miss Dunham is an adventurer. She wanted to get into the African culture. I think she had this burning desire to be exposing her audiences to something new and different. She always wanted to educate her audiences, not just entertain. Not long thereafter, a board member of the Rosenwald Foundation attends one of Dunham's storefront concerts and learns the young dancer is studying to be an anthropologist. It is suggested Dunham ask the foundation for funds to do field research. Picture going in front of the Rosenwald board to ask for money to go study dance, which had never been done before, had never incorporated anthropology and dance before. And she's this little woman from uh, Glen Ellen, Illinois, going in front of this very powerful board to ask for money, $2,400, which was a lot of money. Dunham proposes to study dance in Africa. Legend has it that she appeared before the board, dramatically stripped to her dance togs, and provocatively demonstrated what she wanted to study. I would not audition that way. For me to snatch off my skirt, and well, I was far too modest, <laughs> and stand there and rehearse in rehearsal in shorts, I don't know what I would have had on, and do some primitive movements, it was not possible. So I had to be able to get that fellowship and still be holding my honor on high. The Rosenwald Foundation decides to sponsor her trip, but suggests she take a crash course in field anthropology with Melville Herskovitz. He warns Dunham that it may be dangerous for a woman to travel alone through the continent. Instead, he suggests she explore the roots of African culture transplanted to the New World in the Caribbean. In June of 1935, Catherine Dunham, armed with her notebooks, movie camera, and a head full of research ideas, departs for the islands. 
You'll find that the hills have a, a kind of internal strength, but deceptively smooth and soft in outline. And the trees, the trees are spread, thick foliage. And then, of course, the wind, the wind blowing, and you see the swaying, whether it is sugarcane or coconut trees, swaying, you get that kind of rhythm as well. These are the sort of things that visually make an impression on the choreographer. You see the people coming from the mountains, the people who the people are gonna sell in the market. They have the basket, fruit basket, vegetable basket on their head, but big, large basket, full, and they don't even touch the, the, the things balance on their head and they're coming down. But the, the way they're walking, their skirt swaying. Like they're dancing while they're not dancing, they're just walking, but to people looking at them, you see them dancing because they just swing, swing, swing. <laughs> Dunham's first stop is Jamaica. There she lives with the Maroons, a people in isolated mountain villages who were the first Caribbean slaves to wrest their freedom from a colonial power. From the Maroons, she learns firsthand how deep-rooted African ways are in the New World. In Trinidad and Martinique, she studies how traditional African dance movements have been fused with European steps and dance figures. But it is Haiti which has the greatest impact on Dunham. The island has been independent since the early 1800s and unfettered by colonial rule. African customs and dance have become deeply woven into the fabric of daily life. And there's this sense of this incredible kind of root African culture that is very much at work there. Haiti has this aura of, of independence, but also of the unknown, the, the unknown blackness that is both alluring on one hand, but also scary on the other hand. She could see clearly in the Caribbean the things which had been driven underground in her own United States place like Haiti, they were able to shape their own way of being, their own sense of self, on their own terms. And that is what the dance is about. From the minute I went there, I could see that I could not learn the dances without knowing the people. I wanted to uh, find out the style, formation, type of choreography, type of steps used, and so on and so on, for this single community to have uh, made a firm part of their culture. Catherine wanted to live with the people, to see how they live and how they act, and in doing so, sharing their life. She managed to have uh, their confidence so they could reveal things to her and let her attend ceremonies that they wouldn't let or the people would not. The ceremonies Dunham attends include Vodun rituals. Vodun is a blend of African and Catholic practices, and dance is an integral part of the religion. Vodun is a religion that came from the west coast of Africa, Dahomey, Guinea, Senegal. The words Voodoo means spirit. It's a general name for all deities. It is a set of beliefs and practices which deal with the spiritual forces of the universe. In attending these ceremonies, Dunham is a rare witness to rituals where the dancers become possessed.
the most difficult thing is to describe possession because it's not something you can describe to anybody. It's, it's a spirit that mount the person. They say mountain because you like a horse. The person become a horse, and the, some, the person who who is riding the horse control the horse. Dunham spends months in Haiti. In time, it is suggested that she become initiated in the Vodun religion. I didn't ask to be initiated but you were picked out for a reason. And my reason was because I did the Yom Balu well. That kind of rhythm, which was slow, and which was very involved, involving the whole body, and what you'd feel quiet and soft and slow, and so big at the same time, was wonderful. You can see it. The rhythm is Yavalu, is It's a slow rhythm, a dance of supplication, a dance of prayer. And it's just very uh, moving very slowly because it, it's, it's you're imitating the movement of the snake. But you have a pum, I don't wear do, hey, well, oh, do. But you have a pum, I don't so bo. I go to the you keep singing that song all the time, but the movements are very fluid. I'm sure that Miss Dunham, in going to a lot of the ceremonies, experienced almost out-of-body experience. Not being possessed as they were, because this was their, their culture and their training and their religion, but simply for the joy of movement. And anyone who has ever danced, and you finally conquer a movement that you've been working on for ages, knows the joy of the body and the mind and everything coming together. in the movement, the heat of the room, the smell of the room, the beat of the drums, those little ladies dancing. She got caught up into it totally. And there's no better joy than for your body to just dance, to just dance. For Catherine Dunham, the American dancer and anthropologist, Haiti is the last leg of a year-long study of Caribbean dance. Her research into why black people dance the way they do should have been completed by now. 
but she's reluctant to go home. The more she observes, the more she understands. Dunham was tracing her own roots. You know, her roots as a black person, a person of African ancestry. She would have seen dance as a means of communicating, as a means of expressing life and living itself. The European influence now is also there, but the slaves and their descendants took many of the, the, the European influences and transformed them. And that is what the dance is about. I wanted to know what drove her, what made her go to the roots of her heritage. Her answer was really simple. She wanted to dignify the material. She had seen how this material that she was using as her source was such an integral part of the culture that it came out of. She wanted to bring that as truly and honestly as she could and put it on stage and show people its, its beauty and its glory. In Catherine Dunham's United States of 1936, the limit of what the black dancer could achieve is known as Negro dance. Well, if you were a black dancer, all you could aspire to was to be a shake dancer or a tap dancer or a contortionist or an acrobat, because that's all that was open to you. We needed to see another vision of what black dancers could do. The black dancer did not have a choice. Maybe if they were my skin color or maybe a little bit lighter, they might be able to get into the chorus line. They could not be in any of the evolving concert stage because they were black. They were between a rock and a hard place, literally. I had gained enough knowledge in the West Indies that I knew that I was doing some things from a point that was quite different from what the average person would see when he went to the theater or a rehearsal. When Dunham returns to Chicago, she realizes that new choreography will have to wait. She must first teach her dancers the movements she's experienced and their spiritual dimension. She tells her company they'll learn the steps of the gods. When she came back from Haiti, it was quite a revelation because we found ourselves doing things that did not even seem to me like dance anymore. There were a lot of voodoo movements and pelvic movements that our families were horrified when they saw us doing. A whole different concept of dance because we learned the spiritual part of the dance. In time, these movements become the foundation of an approach to dance known as the Dunham Technique, based on the principle of isolation. She formed this incredible movement system and that is uh, still prevalent today, although she's not given credit for it. You learn to move each part of your body separately, as though it has no connection with the other part of your body. This was isolation of everything, hands, shoulders, hips. The movement of the head, the snap of the finger, the wiggle of the knees and legs. I don't think anyone ever mastered it as well as she did. And contract. Dunham builds her technique on her knowledge of ballet, modern, and Afro-Caribbean dance. It covers the whole range of training the body to move. What was added were the African elements. Four. Her technique was the hardest technique I had ever done. You did all the head movements, head moves at the side. Head movements, I had never done this before, where she said, pull through the ear and go off on the side. All these things, spinning the head around, 
So the head dances. Then we went to the shoulders. And up and down, and up and down. To the rib cage. And out first. Chest way up, clear. To the hips, how to contract the hips front. Isolate the hips to the side, to the back, to the side. How to circle the hips up and down. Take the hands up. Then you put all that together and you move across the floor. Right. 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 Circle it around. Reach out. But of all of the Caribbean movements Dunham teaches, the most exciting comes from the island of Martinique. There, men perform a fighting dance called the Agia, a fusion of African and European combat styles. The Agia developed because slaves were not allowed to possess weapons. The Agia is martial art disguised as dance. As a tool, Dunham uses film she shot in Martinique to teach the dance to her company. She decides to build her first new choreography around the drama of the Agia. Dunham premieres her dance in Chicago on January 27, 1938, less than a year after her return from the West Indies. It was just a love story of a fishing village, I was a fisherman, she was a girl, and the devil was the other one, who was mean. But it, it, it was just a, a Romeo and Juliet. Catherine Dunham is one of those people who could be dismissed as an anthropologist, lifting things from the field onto the stage, not at all. She was an artist as well, and uh, in fact, a theatrical artist. She understood the theater of much of what she saw in the field. She knew that she wanted to make this material palatable to a broad audience, but she was definitely going for the heart and the essence of a culture. Lagia becomes an instant success. But Caribbean-inspired material is not all Dunham wants audiences to appreciate. All along, she sought to build respect for African-American themes as well. The chance to do this comes when the company is invited to New York City. In a new show for Broadway, Tropics and La Jazz Hut, she creates a duet she calls Barrel House Blues, it's based on the slow drag, a couple's dance common to the juke and the honky-tonk. The piece is controversial for audiences in 1940. Barrel House Blues was depicting the time in Chicago when it was cold, and just knowing this lonely woman who felt a little beat up went on in a bar and, and had the time of her life, just for a moment, finds this young man and fantasizes. <laughs> The critics were just baffled. They were ignorant to the fact that this was a combination of the authentic with the artistic. So they reverted back to their safety of, it was sizzling, it was hot, it was torrid, it was sexy and all that business. Though the reviews are enthusiastic, they're laced with a tone of condescension. John Martin, America's leading dance critic, calls Barrel House Blues an incredible vulgarity in the New York Times. Like any innovator, you're bound to give your audience trouble, and Catherine Dunham did. What they saw, many a critic dismissed as cabaret and they felt it had no depth. That wasn't true. It 
was sassy and she was courageous. She would always take risks, always with her material, even though they may uh, criticize her, like maybe that was too risque. She wanted them to know we're complex people. Here's someone who said this is important, vernacular dance. The idea of looking at the blues experience in the body, the idea of looking at the jazz experience in the body, the idea of looking at the spiritual experience in the body through dance, that's a powerful legacy. John Martin said, when he was reviewing Catherine, it's not designed to delve into philosophy or psychology, but to externalize the impulses of a high-spirited, rhythmic, and gracious race. And I asked Catherine at one point about her feelings about John Martin's take on what she did. And she said, in this very, very ladylike, subdued way, he was trying to be helpful. And that's essentially the way you have to look at it. The man's not trying to be malicious. He's not trying to be mean. He just doesn't get it. And he's not the only critic who didn't get it. Celebrity ignites a hectic pace for Dunham. She lectures at Eastern colleges on Caribbean culture, writes magazine articles for Esquire under the pseudonym K. Dunn, and lands a starring role in the hit Broadway musical, Cabin in the Sky. What she had was a combination of magnetism, sexuality, and pure impact that can only be described as star quality. She had that power that when she came upon the stage, you had to look at her. This was Catherine Denham. She was helped a great deal by her husband, John Pratt, who was such a creative person with lights and sets and, and knew just how to costume her. John Pratt was such an integral part of Catherine Dunham and the Catherine Dunham Company. You might want to call him Mr. Catherine Dunham, but he was stronger than that. It was a fascinating relationship because they were both very strong. They were both geniuses at what they did. And I know Miss Dunham inspired him. Dunham also acquires a reputation as a woman to be reckoned with. In 1943, she tangles with the director of the film, Stormy Weather. Stormy Weather stars Bill Bojangles Robinson and Lena Horne, but it's Dunham who steals the show. Well, there's that wonderful scene in Stormy Weather when um, there's the kind of breakaway and Lena Horne is standing beside the window. Of course, Lena's the star of, of Stormy Weather. But let's face it, when we pan away to Catherine Dunham and she stands with her, her 40s fashions, the hat tilted to the side of the head, one sees power. But she actually has to negotiate her place and her sense of self and her sense of who the black dancer was in America at that point with the director of the film. He wanted the whole scene to be the hookers and pimps on the street. She says, no, nothing doing. All of a sudden, we're in another world, a dream world. She has negotiated in that particular film a sense of our perspective on who we are, this larger sense of the black self that we ourselves define. The Dunham Dance Company is one of the best known dance groups in the world, and yet it is difficult keeping the troupe going. 
The Donald Company was characterized by the fact that it was constantly in a state of bankruptcy. It could be a little less bankruptcy or a little more, but the basic uh, situation was always uh, either mild or extreme desperation. To pay the bills, the company tours constantly and performs in nightclubs and private functions. Celebrity is a mixed blessing. We were traveling and performing in a, in a time of extreme segregation. In the war years, we got mixed in with troop trains and army personnel would get very hot about it. They'd begin to smolder. They would pass through our car, which they were not supposed to do, and uh, let loose with epithets like, uh, how, come, how come the niggers have got sleeping accommodations and we don't? But Dunham refuses to be intimidated. At every turn, she uses her fame to counter racism. Wherever she goes in the U.S., she tells the press about hotels which deny her accommodation. She rejects engagements before segregated audiences and speaks out on civil rights for Negroes, even during World War II, when some thought it unpatriotic. In 